This is Glambition Radio, episode number 236 with Susan Hyatt, creator of The Bear Process. Welcome to Glambition Radio. I am your host, Allie Brown. I'm an entrepreneur, mentor, investor, and mom of twins. I love thinking big, doing different, and exploring ideas that disrupt the status quo, especially when it comes to women, because we are rewriting the rules for leadership, business success, making money, and changing the world. And we're doing it with style. Let's go. My team pulled two great reviews for us from Apple Podcasts. I want to give a shout out. The first is XO Lissandra from the US. This is a must listen for elevated thinking and just the best roadmap for especially women leaders. Every week, I look forward to the next episode. And then Stephanie FL from US writes, I've been listening to your podcast for a long time. I can finally say that I consider myself to be a successful woman entrepreneur as this is what I've had to become to help keep the business moving forward. Allie, you're one of my mentors, and I'm so grateful for all that you've shared and all the leadership and mindset skills that I've learned from your podcast. So welcome. We so appreciate the reviews. They keep the good things coming. They keep us in the rankings. They're helping more women find out about the show. And in a sea of madness, it's a good thing to do. Let your colleagues, clients, friends know about this show and that they may enjoy it. All right. Very excited about our guest today, Susan Hyatt. She's a hoot. She's a take no prisoners woman. I kind of knew who she was. And then I was checking out her Instagram a few months ago and I'll save the story for the show, but I was like, let's get this woman on. (laughs) I love outspoken women. I love women who are just unabashedly who they are and have opinions on things and positions on things. And I think it is something that's really needed right now for the women to respect each other in that regard. Many of us have different political views. Many of us have different positions on topics, different ways of looking at things. And if we are able to come together and have conversations and still be that person and say, you know what? And in the spring, let's have lunch. I think that's where we need to be. That's just what I'm feeling lately. Wanted to get that in here in this brief intro today. Susan is the author of two books, Bear and Create Your Own Luck. She's been featured in publications like O Magazine, Women's World Cosmo, Huffington Post, She's a very well-known life coach with some fantastic programs. I asked her to tell us more about those toward the end of the show. And I think most of all, you're going to love her story. And we bonded over the tragedy of some of our work at home wear. I'll just leave it at that. You'll have to listen. And a reminder that our show today is sponsored by The Trust, the new private premier network for seven and eight figure women entrepreneurs. New Times require a new network. And man, are we in new times. So if you or another female leader you know is craving something besides the ordinary, something besides walking into a room and realizing, wow, everyone here is just not where I'm at. And you're starting to feel that, right? It's time. It's time for you to look at this. If you're craving more powerful connections, more elevated conversation, and a modern platform for connecting with other high-performing women, Visit jointhetrust.org. Now get ready for a wild ride of a conversation with Susan Hyatt. Susan, I'd like to know where you are right now. I'm in my home office in Evansville, Indiana, enjoying my fireplace while I talk to you. Tell me about Indiana. I don't know much about Indiana. So Indiana is middle America. I'm not originally from Indiana. I'm originally from Savannah, Georgia. Moved here about 22 years ago with this vision of Midwest romance. (laughs) This is where my husband's from. Picket fence. Picket fence, easy living, family, community. And honestly, it really is all those things. I live in a medium-sized town, about 150,000 people. And... It's a real salt of the earth kind of place to be. Yeah. Well, when I 
when I saw you, you have like a Cosmo feel to you. So then I saw Indiana and I had to do a double take and I'm like, I don't know if that's on brand for Susan. <laughs> but, but the more I, the more I kind of got into your stuff, I'm like, Oh wait, no, it, it is. It's like, yeah. she's, she's about just being who you are, wherever you are. And so, so I have to start off saying, it's very interesting that we were doing a little pre-chat in that you and I, we've been aware of each other. There's a lot of people that you're kind of aware of in this space and going like, Oh yeah, she's cool. She's cool. And then, um, we were going through some prospective guests for the show. And so I started to like, actually look at what you did a little bit more. Like I knew of the book and kind of the theme and mm-hmm. stuff, but then I started following your Instagram and I'm like, Oh, this is interesting. Let's get her on. <laughs> <laughs> because suddenly like in Miss Indiana is like flipping the bird and using the yeah. F bomb and like, Like where, where is this edge? Where did, let's start with you and the edge. And when you were, you know, where did this, you're, you're fired up, you're pissed off, fired up, ready to rock. I don't know what it is, but tell us more (laughs) about this and how it started. Well, I've always been this way. I call it making a scene. You know, as a kid, I was always super mouthy. I wasn't necessarily a rule breaker, but I was a rule challenger. So even from a very young age, I would challenge the status quo, not like any rule, you know, I came home at curfew, you know, but I was more like, Hey, you know, why is it that the boys get to do this and the girls don't? Mm. And why is it that I have a different set of rules than my brother? So I was always mouthy and edgy in that way with concepts and social structures. And I grew up in the South. I grew up being told to tone it down. Don't make a scene. What will people think? And as I grew into adulthood and checked all the boxes, did all the things that were expected of me, I really started to look around and think, you know what, there's got to be more than this. And so I went on my own personal journey. And that phrase make a scene has just always been something that I have wanted to embody like, yeah, make a scene, you know, raise your voice, challenge what you think is unfair or unfit. And so the edge really comes from wanting equity for everyone. Mm -hmm. And I'm fired up and lit up about what we can do together to make the world a better place. So, so where did your career start? Like, like, tell me about the evolution of Susan Hyatt to the one that oh, I wow. see now. <laughs> so in college changed my major four times because I had no real understanding of what I wanted to do. I actually did actually, I'm going to change that because I did know what I wanted to do. Started out as a journalism major And I had an English 101 teacher basically tell me I was wasting my time and that I really wasn't fit for journalism. And at 18 years old, I didn't have the tools that we have now as grown women to say, like, maybe she doesn't know what she's talking about. And Mm -hmm. and that sent me down this path of changing my major. I was once a nursing major. People who know me personally just think that's hilarious because I, I'm somebody who will like sympathy gag with you if you start to get sick. Like I am not, I am not. I, I, I don't know you well, but I just don't think you'd be that nurturing. I don't know. Like just guessing. I'm nurturing of goals, but like if you're sick, like I'm going to order some Grubhub for you, but I'm not coming over yeah. to hold the bedpan. Yeah. So when I exited college, I graduated with a degree in political science and a minor in women's studies, which actually is very on brand, Hmm. but I didn't quite know what to do with it. I started out in PR. And then when I became pregnant with my son, Ryan, I decided I wanted to stay home for a few years with the kids. Well, kid at that time had my daughter Cora a few years later. And then I threw myself into Allie. I was trying to be this like Martha Stewart, Betty Crocker, like the best stay at home mom that ever stayed at home which is hilarious because we all know stay at home moms aren't, that's not what they're doing. I have to admit before I had kids, I'm like, what do these women do all day? Like, mm-hmm. I totally admit that, you know, cause I, I literally mm-hmm. had no idea. I'm like, mm-hmm. what, what are they doing? And then, you know, how, what, you know, I was just like, well, just get a sitter. You know, I, I apologize to all my clients that were moms. <laughs> I said, cause I was like, well, just get a sitter or work harder. What's the big deal? Why can't you do the launch next week? You know? And now I'm like, I'm so sorry. <laughs> twins, right? (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And went through that kind of, I do think we hormonally though, have a little switch then, you know, I, I went through a period that I, I wish I could have taken a year off, 
you know, I really did enjoy it. And you kind of get into enjoying that, that nurturing time and home and being that homebody you didn't get to be. And then I'm going to guess though, you know, like what happened, what happened to me is then you just started getting antsy again to like do a project or do something, you know, with your clients again, get out there, work on a different type of legacy play. Yeah, absolutely. I, you know, I remember my mom coming to visit and I had on like this jean shirt that was my husband's and sweatpants. And she was kind of looking at me and she's like, I just never thought I'd see the day when you're just like, what, what are you doing? Like, like the denim like, shirt, like they make all the women wear in the cleaning commercials, like yes, the Lysol. Yes, like, like it's always this mom dressed like shit. And, yes. <laughs> and I just, I, I was like over efforting, overachieving at staying at home momhood. And I finally started to be like, okay, I'm kind of hiding here. I'm not enjoying this the way someone who right there, there are plenty of women I know who that's what they love being a stay at home mom. That wasn't me. Mm -hmm. I love parts of it, but that wasn't me. Yeah. And so we entered the work world as a residential real estate agent and I was like, this is so great. I'm out of the house showered. I'm making my own, yeah. my own paycheck. You got headshots. Headshots. Right? And, and I was like in this honeymoon period with that for a few years and very quickly became a top earner in my company and in town and built this real estate practice and kind of found myself with golden handcuffs there. I was good at it. But I knew that that really wasn't quite it and mm. wasn't really what I was supposed to be doing. What, did, what were you feeling? Like, what was the feeling? There was this moment, the first flash I have when I was like, this is not it. One of the problems that I had with that gig, and I, listen, I love the real estate industry. My son, who's 22 now, is selling real estate. I'm reliving it all over again. My husband is a commercial realtor and developer. So I love the industry. So when I say this, it was my personal experience in real estate. But the thing that dragged me down was... In residential real estate, you can do your job exceptionally, and there are so many other elements and people involved in any transaction mm. that all of your hard work cannot turn into a commission check because of an inspection, an appraisal, a mortgage lender, uh, you know, all mm. these things beyond your control. A lot of variables. Yeah. A lot of variables. And I would get worn out with, I felt like I was full-time arguing with all the other professionals involved in the transaction. And there was this one moment, my kids are strapped in their car seats in the back of the minivan and, you know, like eating their after school little snacks. And I'm on my, remember Blackberries? <laughs> I was on my mm -hmm. Blackberry arguing with a realtor over a termite inspection. And I looked in the rearview mirror and saw their little faces. And I just was sort of like, you know what? I, this isn't how I want them to remember their mother, mm -hmm. you know, driving like a bat out of hell throwing Cheerios in the back seat, you know, arguing. And so I started to really think about this struggle that I think a lot of ambitious women find themselves in, which is I want to do something that's meaningful and I want to make great money. Mm -hmm. And so where is that spot, an intersection? And I was great at business and I was also great. I'm highly empathetic. And I started just binging on personal development and found a great book that I always recommend to people called Finding Your Own North Star by Dr. Martha Beck, who ended mm. up training me after I read that book and, and really ah. fell in love with the tools. Yeah. Is that where you went to get your original certification and become a coach? Yeah, 2007. Wow. And, you know, here in Indiana, people were like, what are you talking about? A life coach? What? I know in other parts of the world and in our country that it seems like there's a life coach everywhere, but certainly not where I live. No one mm -hmm. had ever heard of it. And certainly when I decided after training to transition out of real estate and start a life coaching company, people were like, you have lost your mind. Like you have lost it. How, what are you doing walking away from this thriving real estate practice and going to do this thing no one's heard of? And I just felt so passionate about how those tools had changed my own life and improved my family that I really wanted to help other women figure out what they wanted to do. And, and that has morphed and evolved over the years, but that was the initial 
entry into coaching. Yeah. Yeah. Now I know that a big theme of your work today, at least is around body positivity. You have a a system or protocol you call bear. Tell me about the evolution into that space. And, And is that mainly what you do now? Or is it kind of something adjacent? How does how does what tell me about your content? Yeah, sure. So so bear organically evolved over time. When I became a coach, one of the things that I really struggled with personally was overeating. And I was not moving my body at all. I used to joke I was a professional couch potato you know, someone who didn't exercise, I was like whipping through fast food three times a day. And so I hired my own coach to help me deal with food and body stuff. And I remember through that process thinking, holy crap, like if I can get to the root of this for myself, I want to help other women do that. And so I started adding to my stream of income as a coach, weight loss coaching, But what I discovered over time was that what I was doing with women, like whether or not they lost weight was irrelevant. What I was really doing with them was getting to the root of diet culture and unwinding that. And I really felt like my special sauce there was helping a woman become aware of diet culture messaging, unwind it, reprogram herself and learn to love the skin that she's in. So pivoting from willpower to pleasure based. And I formalized it. I started really paying attention to what are the things I'm doing with these women that's really getting the most bang for the buck, so to speak. And that eventually became the bear process. And so I started teaching bear classes and certifying coaches in the bear process, published a book, did a TEDx talk. And so I would say it's an equal part of my business. I have these two sides. One is helping entrepreneurs make money and the other is helping women love the skin they're in. And there's always an intersection there because the bear process really can be applied to business as well. Yeah. And they probably, you know, it it probably goes together because when I'm working with clients, typically if, if there is a body issue and they're accelerating their business or possibly vice versa, right? Mm -hmm. Something needs to be worked on before they can get to that next level. Would yes, you agree? I would agree. And one of the ways that women really sabotage themselves or distract themselves is through dieting. So it's like, oh, instead of, you know, it's like this distraction, they may be growing their business leaps and bounds. And then all of a sudden they're going to be like, I think I'm going plant based or I think I'm going to do this. <laughs> sorry, sorry, you just, I don't know why that struck me so funny. Like they're about to break their first million. You're like, I'm going to only eat, you know, grapes for the next 30 days or just something like. <laughs> it, it, you can count on it. You can count on it because it's like one of the things that women want to <laughs> because of our brainwashing. And so it's like people will get in huge <laughs> arguments with me online about this. And I'm like, you can call it anything you want. You are on a damn diet. <laughs> it's like when you're finished doing that to yourself, let's talk. And now, and now I'm almost finished with what's called Bold, which is my third book, which is the bear process, but for girls, because what we know Mm. is that the average age girls start dieting is eight years old. Wow. And if we can get in front of that and help them learn how to focus on expanding their lives instead of shrinking their waistlines, if we can get to girls early enough and say, hey, you're going to get all these messages and it's nonsense. And instead, we want you to be powerful and confident and focus on what's amazing about you other than how you look. Mm. Now, can I, I want to play devil's advocate for a minute because I know there are times in, in my life that, you know, when I, so for example, you know, after I had my kids, I, my, both my twins were over seven pounds. I was just, and I gained so much weight. Like I was just ginormous. And then I kind of settled into that weight and was, was fine with it, honestly. And then, then I, I got to this phase in my business where I felt I had to, I don't know, I got powered up and did, and did want to focus on that for a while. Like to me, that, that seemed to fire me up or fuel me in a different way. Now, now today I don't do all the tracking and all that stuff, but it gave me a sense of, of control that I think I was looking for. Are there times in your experience that that is recommended or in most of your situations, it's a different situation? So in my opinion, there's not anything wrong. If a woman has a goal, for her body. 
And I don't care what the goal is. I just want her to understand why she has the goal. So when women say like, I just had twins and, and I've decided I really want to lose some weight or I want to, you know, whatever it is, I want washboard abs. I want, you know, whatever. It's just, okay, where did you get that idea and why do you want it? And as long as the reason that you want it isn't rooted in the, this idea that you'll somehow be more successful or happier or more alluring or whatever it might be, mm -hmm. it's like, let's get, like you just said the thing, like I was honestly great with how I looked anyway, yeah. but I just decided I wanted to do this thing. As long as it's coming from a place of abundance and peace and not this place of like, ew, or I'm not good enough unless, right? Yeah. It was a different feeling. Cause I had those feelings too. And then would, and it would know that was like a darker place. Right. Yeah. And then it was, it was like a, a different, it was like a, a lighter place. And I think more, more health-based too, because I just, I, I needed to work on my energy. I needed, you know, I was ready to power up again, my business mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. I needed my body to, it, it was more like my body to perform at a, a better level the way it used to. You know, you know, and you're using words that I use because I talk about power foods and I talk mm. about, I mean, it, it's an energy epidemic, really. So any kinds of like how you move and how you eat and all those things, that's exactly why I work out now and why I eat the way that I eat, because there are things I want to accomplish and I've got to have my energy. I've got to mm -hmm. have my A game if I'm going to accomplish that. If I'm like going to eat half a chocolate cake tonight, I can guarantee you tomorrow's not going to go real well, mm -hmm. <laughs> especially at 47. There are certain things that I'm not going to consume, not necessarily because I care so much about my gene size. It's more about my output that yeah. I care about. It's a different game, man, isn't it? Totally Late different 40s. game. Yeah, yes. totally. Now you mentioned something earlier. I want to circle back to you. You talked about I can't remember exactly what you said, something about shifting to pleasure in the advice that you give. Can you give an example about that, changing something that we typically would see as kind of a boxed in, you know, instruction and you've, you flipped it to something that brings us pleasure? Totally. So, well, I think whether it's in business or with body, the message that we receive and think is fact is sometimes like, oh, I have to have more willpower or I just don't have enough willpower. If I had enough willpower, I would look that way or I would have that money. And honestly, for women, I mean, if you haven't noticed, we <laughs> we have so much willpower. I mean, look at all the things that we do for our families and our kids and our communities and our businesses and all those things. It's much more, and, and I have found that women respond and thrive, not from trying to white knuckle it, whether it's business hours or some kind of external eating plan, mm. it's much more of a pleasure-based thing. So when I'm working with a woman on her business, Sure, there are things that I do in my business, and I'm sure you do too, that aren't my favorite. But overall, the business is based on what lights me up, what gets me excited, the mission of what I'm doing versus like, oh, I have to do this sales funnel because bro over here told me that that's how I'm going to reach <laughs> multiple seven figures. Yep, right? and you need a hundred point webinar and 14 funnels. Mm -hmm. Oh my God. That is the sound. Yep. Right. I'm like disrupting all of it. So it's like, like, no, like we're going to start with passion and pleasure. And like, if you want to talk about something like really simple, the environment that we're working in, when you were like, Hey, where are you, where are you tuning in here from? And I'm looking around this office that has been designed and decorated to bring me so much pleasure mm. as opposed to just doing with what was here, you know, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it's like we, we are women, I think require visual clarity in their environment. They require being fed in many different ways through their senses than just a very pragmatic formulaic plan. Yeah. I remember when we, um, the twins changed that too. I was so into like decor and everything was beautiful in my old life, right? <laughs> in my perfect home <laughs> in LA, my friends still laugh. They're like, you used to greet me in your Gucci pants. And I'm like, yeah, it's different now. So, <laughs> you know- Are you wearing a jean shirt and, sw and sweatpants? I'm wearing like cute leggings. I'm like upscale 
athleisure, right? Yeah, yeah. Right. So like, but, but in my old life, I would have greeted you with Gucci pants and, you know, <laughs> this is just what, so, so then we move here and I have the twins and I moved my mom here. I mean, it's just, it's just about, and it, I didn't even notice Susan that my office was the last thing to get decorated. And meanwhile, that's where, that's like my, my life, like that, like I'm, right. I'm the breadwinner. Like this is who I am. This is what I do. And it was an afterthought until I sat there for two years. And this will, I don't think I've ever shared this. This will surprise people who know me because everything I touch or do is usually good looking, you know, everything's mm-hmm, like, mm-hmm, it's brand yeah. brand. And, and I don't, I don't remember how this happened. I think we, we moved in really quickly and my mom somehow decided that any of the furniture that didn't fit in the casita was going to be put in my office or my bedroom, which is, you can imagine, you know, that generation thinks their furniture is still awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Stuff that you can't get rid of. And, um, so it looked like, you know, a 75 year old woman's bedroom, like, <laughs> Oh my and, God. and I remember when I gave my, it was like catching a cold. Like suddenly I realized I want a beautiful office mm. and I want a chandelier and I want to go pick out the color. And I'm, I want a big CEO desk, not a workstation, you know? And I, right. I gave myself that permission again. It was, it was game changing. It was like a real game changer. So I love that you talk about that. The beauty you surround yourself with and your environment, our environments feed us. Oh, they absolutely do. And that's part one of the steps in the bear process is about evaluating environment and not just, you know, not just your furniture and things like that, although that is super important, but the conversations you're having and the Mm -hmm. things you tolerate in your energetic space. And hey, like I just redid this office. And so I had that moment that you're having as well, where I'm like, why am I okay with this and this ugly filing cabinet and some of this stuff going on here. You know, it was a real, like I was okay with it until Mm. I wasn't. And then like you, when I wasn't okay with it, when I kind of recognized it, it was like, oh, oh, we're changing things up in here. This this needs to be different. Yeah. So this is amazing. So your, your work kind of, it goes different layers. It's in women's lives. It's in their businesses. It's Mm -hmm. in their health. You know, it's, it, it's overarching this whole philosophy. It really is. And it's really fun for me in the sense that when I'm business coaching and they have an issue, I mean, I can always trace it back to something that's bear related. And if a woman is really stuck in hiring me for the bear process and they're in business for themselves, it's showing up in their business too. So it's, it's a, it's an interesting, it is layered. It's very layered and it's, it's fun work. Mm. Now I'm not aware of like how your exact business model, you know, live online, all this stuff, but how, how has this year been for you in general with COVID and shutdowns and travel limitations? Has it affected your business at all? Right, right. Well, we had to pivot and we had to pivot quick. So fortunately, when I started this business in 07, my kids were little. And so I'm used to being online and doing stuff from a home office Mm -hmm. and not, you know, I know how to do all this. But in the past couple of years, I was certainly doing much more travel, especially for the book tour. A big stream of income that I have wound down was international retreats. And I also was doing some some live events and we had a whole year of a ton of events planned, live events. And we were like, never mind, <laughs> let us pivot back to doing some of this stuff online. So one of my biggest events that we just hosted as a virtual event instead of a live event is called Finish Strong. And, you know, I'm like, well, mm. there's no yacht party, but how can we make this interesting for people doing it from home and make it the best it can possibly be? So we did have to really change. I'm proud to say that even though 2020 has been a really challenging year, it's grown me as a leader quite a bit. And our company has really grown, but it's been, you know, it's taken a lot of extra efforting. I bet. Yeah. To pivot all that. But now we're, we're built for all seasons, aren't we? Yep. Yeah. It wasn't yep. pretty, but now yep. we're here. <laughs> I know. Built for all seasons is such a great way to say Contingency it. Contingency plan. We've got it. You know, it's, yep, it's, it's documented, that. right? Yep. Yep. Move the yacht party to zoom pronto. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I just, I can't wait for in person again. I just hosted a retreat and I was, I was thrilled that over half the women still came, but it was, um, you know, it, it was, 
I have to say, like, I just heard this shared. It's so beautiful. Like human gathering, human connection, human touch is a nutrient. And, Uh and the online has been great. And thank goodness we are so blessed to still be able to earn a living this way and connect with these incredible people like you this way. But man, there's nothing like shutting the doors and having a real conversation. There is nothing like it. And, and I just, I love it so much. I will say that now that I've, you know, basically been home since March, I have relished in like, Hey, like I'm not constantly getting on planes, but when we're allowed to do it again, I think I'll have a nice blend back because I do like being like knee to knee with people. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Put on some real pants. <laughs> Yep. I'm still wearing pants. I'm wearing real <laughs> pants for you, Allie, even though you can't see me. I'm wearing very high quality leggings today. I love that. <laughs> but it was great to suddenly realize, oh, I need to put on some real clothes and go to a meeting. I was very excited. I miss the bad coffee and, you know, <laughs> hotel, hotel notepads and yeah, room service. And you just, you just kind of miss all, miss all that stuff. So before I kind of bring it on home, tell everyone a bit about your programs, where they can learn, learn more. Tell us about the book. Yeah, sure. I think a couple of the easiest places for people to get to know me is I am on Instagram quite a bit at Susan Hyatt. I have a podcast called Rich Coach Club, which is for female entrepreneurs. We are unapologetic about being ambitious and making money. And I also have a YouTube TV show called Go Time TV that I think you might find hilarious, Allie, if you choose to check it out. Go Time. Go Time. What And what is Go Time? Go Time is basically like a motivational life coaching show. So oh, a little pep talk. It's basically like, hey, you got one life, make it count. It's go time. All right. All right. <laughs> and the book is called Bear. So you can obviously order that off of Amazon or get it at any major bookstore. And um, I was pleasantly surprised when I got my October royalty check notification that my publisher said it's doing better in year two than it did in year one, which is pretty outstanding. So I think y'all will like it if you want to check it out. That, and you know what? That means it's a damn good book. You know, everyone wants, everyone wants the sale, big sales out of the gate. And yeah, that's great. And good, good. If you got that, but like, that's, that's when, when you still hear people talking about a book years later, like that's the kind of book you want the perennial. I was pretty pleased about that. So yeah. thank you. Pretty timeless information, I would guess. Yeah, totally. And I also actually just started a life coaching university. So the university for life coach training, if anybody wants to train to become a life coach, we got you. Perfect. All right. So Susan, can you wrap up with three great pieces of advice for all the women listening around the world? Absolutely. So here's my top three. Number one, you have to move your God pod. This body was meant to move. So I don't care if it's dancing in your living room or walking around the block, pick out something where you can move your body because you need to get emotion out, process emotion, especially right now. So, so totally break the transaction between movement and weight loss and just move for your mental health. Number one, number two, you really need to have a supportive squad around you. So if you don't have that in your life, life where you live, get online find mentors, find people who are going through what you're going through and want to achieve what you want to achieve. I wouldn't have been able to accomplish any of this if I didn't actively seek out the right squad members. And then lastly, I would love for you to consider that you have plenty of willpower and I want you to become a woman. I invite you to become a woman who's devoted to her own pleasure. If you become devoted to your own pleasure, your entire life changes. I love that. Susan, thank you so much. This has been such a great discussion. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Really enjoyed it. And everyone, you want to pick up the book. Can you give the book title again? Yep. It's called Bear, B-A-R-E. And it's just seven steps to love your body. Fantastic. All right. Great. And I hope to stay in touch with you. I would love that. Maybe in person one day. Imagine that. I know. (laughs) It's super great. We can both wear weed pants. All right, hun. (laughs) Take care. Thank you. Bye. Thank you for joining me for this episode of Glambition Radio. If you enjoyed the show, make sure you subscribe so you automatically get new shows every week. And I'd love if you left us a review. We are on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, and other platforms. And I'd love to hear from you. 
come join the conversation online. You'll mostly find me on Instagram, but also on Facebook, Twitter, and more. Just head to AllieBrown.com. You will find them all there. And you can also learn about upcoming opportunities to meet in person. Glambition Radio is the elevated conversation for women leaders, and I'm honored you've tuned in.